For the past year and a half, the GPU market has been, for lack of a better term, completely irrational. This has been due to several factors, but the largest and most consequential was cryptocurrency mining. However, over the past couple of months, crypto prices have come tumbling down and brought GPU prices with them. So with more GPUs on the market now than ever before, which budget card should you look out for? I do have to say, you're getting a way better value for your money now than in 2019. Before we get into this list, I just want to preface this video with the fact that GPU prices can and do change pretty rapidly. As such, this is more of a snapshot into the current pricing as of the upload of this video. Obviously, I can't give you a 100% accurate answer as to which GPU fits your needs, but this is more of a list for which GPUs would be a good starting point. Without any further ado, let's dive into some budget GPUs for 2022. The first card we'll be discussing today is the Cult Classic GTX 970. Coming in between 110 and 130 USD, this budget champ from 2014 includes a cut down 28 nanometer GM204 chip with 13 SMs and 56 ROPs active. Consuming a rated 148 watts with two 6 pin PCIe power connectors, the 970 isn't all that efficient anymore, but it's also not all that inefficient either, and should comfortably fit into systems with lower power budgets. This card rather famously also features a split 4 gigs of GDDR5, with 3.5 gigs clocked for 196 gigabytes per second and the remaining 512 megs at 28 gigabytes per second. It may sound kind of sketchy for Nvidia to divide the memory bus up, but if you're careful with your settings usage, it doesn't really cause too many issues. The card, while really starting to show its age, is now generally considered the baseline performance level for entry-level 1080p. I have a review on the channel discussing the card, and from what I experienced on and off-camera, it's still very competent if you're looking to put together a gaming build on the cheap. It won't play at max settings anymore, but if you're not a graphics fiend, it should hit a nice sweet spot in terms of price to performance. Up next is another classic, but a generation later. That is the GTX 1066 Gigabyte, and look exclusively for 6 Gigabyte models. This 120 watt card is built on a fully active 16 nanometer GP106 die. Coming in with 10 SMs and 48 ROPs, the card is technically less beefy than the previously mentioned 970, but the die shrink, combined with some slight architectural improvements, has bumped the clocks to a stock boost of 1709 MHz. Yet, in the real world, it sits comfortably between 1900 and 2000 MHz on most models. The memory size is also larger than the 970, coming in at 6GB, which means that the card will be able to accommodate 1080p resolutions quite comfortably. Now one thing I will say is that because this is a Pascal-based chip, it is not compatible with ray tracing or DLSS. And while the same can be said for the 970, I know that some people really care about RT and ML performance, and this is just not the card for that. Another nice upside about the card, though, is the price and compatibility. Only requiring a single 6-pin PCIe power connector, it fits more performance in a package that's more efficient than the 970, meaning you'll be able to run it in a wider variety of systems. Price, though, comes in at between 160 and 200 USD, which is actually a similar price to its similarly performant last-gen sibling than GTX 980. I would recommend buying the 1060 over the 980, though, but if you've only got a 980 available where you live, it would make an adequate substitute for the newer Pascal card. It's hard to pass up, and I personally remember my 1060 being a blast when I owned it. Our next recommendation is the RX 584GB. While the 8GB model would allow for superior performance and workloads such as rendering or editing, the price in my region is ultimately what turns me off from recommending that model. The 4GB models can be found for similar prices to the GTX 1066GB, ranging anywhere between 170 to 200 USD. However, the 8GB models sell for upwards of 220. For that money, it's worth picking up a 1070, as it has the same amount of VRAM but significantly more performance. The 4GB flavor, though, actually boasts superior DirectX 12 performance over the 1060. However, like the previous NVIDIA card, it lacks RT support, so it's ultimately a card that has slightly more potential than the 1060 with similar features for a similar price. 
in terms of die configuration, we get a 14 nanometer based Polaris 20 chip, sporting 36 compute units clocked at 1340 MHz and 32 ROPs. It's got a relatively large amount of ALUs on chip, but its lack of rasterization pipelines is what limits its performance the most. Power is also higher than the 1060 or the 970, coming in with a TDP of 185 watts, supplied by a single 8-pin PCIe power connector. Power, in all honesty, isn't that bad when compared to some of the newer GPUs available on the market, but it is a decent amount less efficient than the 1060. It's overall a great value card, though I will say it may not last as long as the 1066 gig due to the 4 gig memory buffer. Like I mentioned with the 970, 4 gigs should be enough if you're smart with your settings and stick to playing at 1080p. But if you're desperate for a performant yet relatively inexpensive card, the RX 584GB might be worth checking out. Up next is a slight jump up in performance and price. Hold on a second, editing pros you here. So I just checked the prices of 1070s on eBay in the US and they are like shockingly low. I'm talking less than $200 for a 1070 with a pretty decent cooler and 170 for a blower style. If anything, buy a blower style and mod it to have a different cooler. Just start thinking about getting one of these cards while they are cheap, because they are easily the best value card on this list. And on top of that, the slightly more powerful 1070 Ti is going for 220. I'm glad that these early 2020 prices are returning. All right, back to the regularly scheduled video. The specs of the 1070 are still strong enough to pull its weight in 2022 by a significant margin. The actual GPU itself on this card is the 16 nanometer Pascal GP104 die. It's cut down and uses a standard GDDR5 memory controller as opposed to the GDDR5X one on the 1080. But all this really means is that memory overclocking on this card is limited. For actual compute and rasterization, the card features 15 SMs and 64 ROPs. It's able to parallelize tasks better than any of the previously mentioned cards on this list. And at a TDP of 150 watts, translating to a single 8-pin PCIe connector, it's a very efficient card. But if you want actual performance figures, I have a review on the channel of my 1070 Founders Edition that you might be interested in checking out if you're considering one of these cards. Keeping with the seeming obsession I've developed for Pascal, our next recommendation may be leaving the field of budget, but it's a great card to keep an eye out for nonetheless. The GTX 1080 is a former flagship card from the Fable year of 2016. And like that year, it was the last great one before we got repeatedly destroyed by the powers that be. All jokes aside, this card offers very competitive 1440p performance on almost all games at medium to high settings. I still have my 1080, and even though I've metaphorically moved on to bigger and better pastures, I can attest that this thing is still kicking ass in the areas where it counts. It draws 180 watts and utilizes a fully unlocked GP104 chip, meaning we get 20 SMs and 64 ROPs. However, like I mentioned with the 1070, this card utilizes 10 gigabit per second GDDR5X, bumping memory bandwidth by a decent amount. I'm sure that having more active ALUs is what's giving the 1080 a performance edge over memory clocks, but it certainly doesn't hurt. A reason these cards could be going for so cheap is because they are honestly terrible at mining. I've tried using the card I have to mine just to see what happens, and the design of the GDDR5X means that it actually performs similarly to a 1070 but draws more power. Miners just aren't interested in them at that point, which might be why we're seeing such low prices. Either way, take advantage of it to get one of these on the cheap. The next card I'm going to recommend is an obligatory inclusion, the RX 574GB. This card has attained an almost legendary status among PC gamers, and for good reason. When it released in 2017, it absolutely annihilated its primary competition, the 1050Ti, in price and performance. When the last mining boom ended in 2019, these cards were dirt cheap as they were pretty decent at mining for the power draw, and they were unloaded on the market. Now they're slightly more expensive, coming in at 110 to 120 USD, but that's still not that bad of a price considering how much they were going for just a few months ago. For the money you pay, you get a cut down Polaris 20 die in the same vein as the RX 580. However, the 570 features only 32 active compute units and ROPs, meaning it's overall less powerful. 
You shouldn't get the impression that it's weak though, as it's still beefy enough to tackle 1080p gaming at reasonable settings with ease. Overall, if you have not heard the good word of the Church of RX 570, it might be worth looking into as these prices don't look too bad. These next two recommendations I'm just going to clump together as they're basically one and the same. The Ryzen 7 5700G and Ryzen 5 5600G are probably the go-to options for gamers looking to get into gaming at the lowest possible price. What makes these chips different from traditional Ryzen chips is the fact that they are APUs, meaning they sport relatively beefy integrated graphics as opposed to something you'd find on an Intel chip. The 5700G uses a Vega 8 compute block, featuring 8 compute units and 8 ROPs. Meanwhile, the 5600G utilizes a Vega 7 compute block, featuring 7 compute units and 8 ROPs. While these iGPUs aren't going to be driving native 4K 120Hz gaming, for entry-level performance, you might be able to get by on the lowest setting depending on the game, of course. Something like Overwatch, CSGO, Valorant, or Fortnite would run relatively well at 1080 or 900p. If you were going to go with a CPU and like a $50 graphics card, it might be worth just considering one of these chips as it kills two birds with one stone. Now one thing you should be cognizant of is your DDR4 speed and latency. Unlike a standard graphics card, the GPUs here don't have dedicated chips for video memory. Instead, they create a pool inside your main memory, which it can then use to store data like textures, words, or even just arrays of primitive data types. This can be an advantage as you can change the size of your VRAM pool on the fly, but it comes with bandwidth penalties as it's using DDR4 as opposed to much higher clock GDDR6 or GDDR6X. You also get an 8-core CPU with the 5700G and a 6-core CPU with the 5600G, meaning that you'll get a very capable and responsive system out of the box. There are some downsides to these chips though, such as PCIe 3.0 support, but in the grand scheme of things, they are great alternatives to save some money by combining two of the most expensive parts of your system. Okay, so the last recommendation I'm going to be making is for the graphics fiends, and that's the RTX 2060. Now, at the moment, it's priced between 220 and 270 USD, which is kind of disappointing for a 6 gig card in 2022, but it comes with all the fancy ray tracing and DLSS support. It's honestly the lowest end RTX card that is worth buying at the moment, as the RTX 3050 is not only more expensive, but it gets outperformed by the 2060 in almost all workloads. The card though draws a rated 160 watts and features a cut down 12 nanometer TU106 die with 30 SMs, 240 tensor cores, and 48 ROPs active. Clock for clock, Turing CUDA cores are more powerful than Pascal in both integer and floating point, and are still stronger than Ampere in integer, but fall behind in floating point. This means the 2060 can basically match the 1080 in rasterization, but destroys it in half float and other low bit depth operations. If you're a CUDA programmer and you're interested in doing some machine learning work, then the 2060 is a great starting point, especially given it's cheaper than the 3050. That was the mid-2022 budget GPU roundup. There are definitely some better GPUs in there than others, but I felt as if this was a somewhat comprehensive list that covered a rather tough pricing sector. Overall, I would suggest you do some research on the GPU you're interested in and try to see how it fits into your overall system. If you're only gaming at 1080p 60Hz, then you don't need as much power than if you're driving 1440p or 4K. The beauty about PC hardware is its customizability. If you want a GPU but don't want to shell out the big bucks, then looking up reviews of budget hardware and seeing what others are saying is probably the best way to give you the most amount of options. It's your choice at the end of the day, so why not make the most of it? So thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. I appreciate the people who stuck around during this kind of absence, but I have plenty of content on the way. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.